not our turn. No, no. It's the way we've always gone. God forbid you give anything new a go. Excuse me? I'm sure I have a Bluetooth stereo, don't I? <laughs> Was that not our turn? This way is much better. More reliable. It is easier this way. But we'll turn off soon, don't worry. The maps say to turn off as soon as possible. Ah, don't mind them maps. I am sweltering. All the signs are saying to turn off now. I know, love. We just need to go a bit further and we'll turn off then. I'm going to pull in up here. What for? Petrol. Is he coming back? Are we going on without him? I think that was our turn. I know. I'm sorry, all right? It's not easy, you know? We don't know where any of these turns lead. And do we know where this one goes, where it ends? Are you going to get out somewhere along the way like he did? I don't know. Okay. So if your stop is somewhere along the way, you can just hop out. And I'll just head on and hope we haven't missed the last turn. Today we'll be showing you some of those um, virtual plays. You're all very, very welcome back. And by the sound of the, the noise over the break, there's some great conversations already happening. Um, welcome back to this session three on the uh, just transition. Because when we consider the changes that are, that are involved, as certainly as we heard in our last session, we can't neglect the social and economic dimensions to this transformation. This third session, our session of Accelerate, will look at just that, the just transition. And you know, I often hear Mir Robinson of the Elders, our former president, say that whilst climate change is man-made, that women are the solution, that they are the agents of change who will bring things along. So we make no apology that our next session is an all-female panel, uh, three expert speakers who are going to examine this vital question of how to decarbonise our economy and still ensure that we leave no one behind. Um, let's welcome, I'll int or introduce them individually, but let's welcome Tracy Crow, Dr Jean Moore and Dr Brenda Boardman to the stage. <clears throat> That's a problem. Our first speaker is Tracy Crow, Senior Director and uh, the Chief of Staff at Sustainable Energy for All. Tracy oversees the execution of SE for All strategy and its business plan, which is centred around the pursuit of SDG Go 7, which is access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all by 2030. So, Tracy, I'll hand the... It's nice, actually, to have someone up here with me. It was a bit lonely and all that virtual space. But, Tracy, I'll hand over the real floor to you to be our first speaker. Thanks.
Good afternoon, everyone. It is a, uh, um, a real pleasure to be here today. Uh, I want to thank the IIEA I I I I and ESB for convening on this um, uh, really critical topic. Um, indeed, an honor to be part of a conference on accelerating the transition to a net zero future. Um, just to, to you know, give you just a brief introduction to the organization that I come from, Sustainable Energy for All is an international organization working in partnership with the UN, um, as well as leaders in government, the private sector, civil society, um, other international organizations on Sustainable Development Goal 7. So we, we are very focused. Uh, we, we have a laser focus on Sustainable Development Goal 7, um, but in alignment uh, and in support of the Paris uh, Climate Agreement as well. So to get us started, uh, make sure I know how to use my slides here, good. Um, so I wanna just start with three words. Climate, energy, development. I'm starting with three words and I will end with three words because if you don't take anything else away from what you hear from me today, I hope that you will take away those three words, climate, energy, development. The transition to a net zero future must address all three holistically. We cannot reach net zero by mid-century without first achieving Sustainable Development Goal 7, which is access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all by 2030. At SC for All, that is our definition of a just and equitable energy transition. So we're, we're hearing every day about the climate crisis. Uh, there are more disasters, more impacts, the losses in the billions are making headlines every day. Our urgency to act is growing exponentially, as it must. But energy accounts for about three quarters of our greenhouse gas emissions globally. So we cannot address the climate crisis without addressing energy. And that, of course, has become all the more complicated with the war in Ukraine and the major impacts on energy, particularly here in Europe. But what we are not hearing about every day is the energy access crisis and the development crisis. Again, climate, energy, and development are all and must be interlinked. So there's a fundamental question that we have to ask ourselves. As we work to address our climate and energy crisis, as we work towards that net zero future, will we do so in a just and equitable manner? Will we honor the promise that is embedded in the Paris Agreement, that's embedded in our sustainable development goals to ensure no one is left behind. So there are still 733 million people around the world who do not have any electricity, not even a basic level of electricity. Of this global number, 77%, 589 million, live in sub-Saharan Africa. In many of these countries, access rates are still below 50%. So imagine if half of your population did not have access to electricity. The situation with clean cooking is even more dire. And I, I've heard a lot about you know, energy being, the energy crisis being focused on electricity. So for us, it's electricity and clean cooking. Uh, sustainable Development Goal 7, when we're talking about energy access, it's both. It's electricity and clean cooking. There are 2.4 billion people around the world. A third of the global population, in 2022, a third of the global population that does not have access to clean cooking solutions. So we're far off track from achieving SDG 7 by 2030 and at the current rate, at the end of this decade, we will still have 670 million people without electricity and two billion people still cooking with dirty fuels. In our efforts to achieve net zero, we have to address energy poverty. Now think about the impacts, and these are just a couple that I'll mention. 
A lack of access to electricity for small businesses forces a reliance on highly polluting diesel-powered generators. One study, uh, one recent study from Woods McKenzie conservatively estimates that there's more than 100 gigawatts of diesel gensets operating across Africa. And at least 17 countries in Africa have more diesel genset capacity than grid-connected power. The pollution and climate impact of that, and some studies have said it's close to 1,000 coal-fired power plants. Clean cooking. It contributes to deforestation and results in household air pollution that prematurely kills over three million people a year, the majority of whom are women and children. Why isn't that viewed as a crisis? Three million people, um, premature deaths every year. Energy is an essential part of our everyday lives. Access to clean and affordable energy is the prerequisite for development, for economic growth, employment, poverty reduction, for quality education and health care, and for gender equality. SDG 7 calls for universal access to modern energy for all. Modern should mean more than just enough electricity to power a light bulb or charge a phone. Development requires more than a basic level of household energy. By most measures, Modern energy access is achieved when an individual's annual electricity consumption reaches between 50 and 100 kilowatt hours a year. The world average is just over 3,000 kilowatt hours. And in high income countries, it's over 6,700 kilowatt hours per capita. There are no high income countries today with annual electricity consumption below 3,000 kilowatt hours per capita. In comparison, in Africa, the annual per capita electricity consumption is around 500 kilowatt hours. To put it in perspective, that's about the same as the electricity needed to power an efficient American refrigerator. So we need to change the narrative of what it means to have access. And we cannot focus only on decarbonization of existing systems. To achieve a just and equitable energy transition, the scope and definition of energy access must grow. And we must also focus on building out new energy systems powered by clean energy sources, sufficient for productive use, and to drive economic development. Turning now to what's needed and, and how we can support a just and equitable energy transition. First and foremost, we need ambition. We need much, much, much greater ambition. Uh, and we also need just recognition. Um, I, I think that's part of the problem that we see is that you know, the, in the climate conversation, uh, it is getting, getting elevated, it is getting attention as it needs to, um, but energy and energy access uh, has been struggling to really reach that same level. And again, recognizing that we can't solve the climate crisis without solving the energy crisis, and energy must include energy access. So we really are at a pivotal point in what we call the decade of action. We need bold new commitments. Um, and an example of this uh, were the UN energy compacts that were introduced during last year's UN high-level dialogue on energy. Uh, that high-level dialogue on energy was the first time the UN General Assembly had called for a leader-level event on energy in 40 years. So that can tell you where we are today, um, but at least recognition from the UN side um, that, that energy is at this crisis point and it must be addressed holistically with climate. Um, and by the way, on the energy compacts, uh, I do want to have conversations with ESB and the, co and the government of Ireland uh, about signing those compacts. So I'll, I will find you after I, um, after I finish. Um, and, and just to note, the Ukraine war and the resulting energy, food, and security crisis, um, we've, I think we've really heard it already said today, but we cannot have that distract, and, it's, and instead it really should um, and must focus our attention on the importance 
of a just and equitable energy transition that ensures energy access and energy security for everyone. Accurate and transparent data is critical. Uh, learning about the, the new system that's uh, being developed is fabulous. Um, wish it was available today versus in, in 2030. But countries really do need data-driven, evidence-based, and bespoke energy transition plans. Uh, and an energy transition plan provides a credible pathway to achieving energy access by 2030 and net zero emissions by mid-century. So it brings those two together. An example of this is Nigeria's energy transition plan uh, that was developed um, in partnership with SE for All and the government of Nigeria um, um, and debuted last year at COP26. But this energy transition plan is really what spurred the government of Nigeria and President Buhari to announce a net zero commitment by 2060 at COP uh, in November last year. So we think these, these energy transition plans that provide a uh, very detailed sector, a yeah, multi-sector plan uh, are really what can help a, a country uh, put together a viable pathway to net zero uh, that also includes energy access. Uh, another component of this um, in terms of data and transparency and, and, and so forth are integrated energy plans. So uh, an energy transition plan is a long-term plan to mid-century for net zero, uh, but an integrated energy plan is a geospatial-based um, model that lets you uh, identify down to the community level the best technology for achieving energy access, and it looks at off-grid, mini-grid, and on-grid. Um, it looks at affordability of the community. It looks like it looks at lots of the, the social dynamics and so forth. Um, but an integrated energy plan in the short term, an energy transition plan for the longer term. We also have to recognize that different countries have different pathways to achieve net zero depending on where they are on energy access and development. Consider that Africa's cumulative share of global carbon emissions is around 3%. Use of the current identified gas reserves in Africa would raise their share of emissions to 3.5%. So there's a lot of discussion in Europe um, now about um, um, partnering with Nigeria and other countries in Africa for their gas reserves. What's missing is the investment in those countries and their own use uh, to develop their own economies, to use those gas reserves, to use gas as um, stabilizing as they increase their share of renewables. So there is a disconnect. Um, and I think we, we we're starting, starting to hear that disconnect um, uh, get corrected in some of the conversations we've had recently. Um, but there was a level of disconnect uh, that was really disconcerting and, and was not very productive in the conversations with, with African countries up till now. Um, some African countries need and will considerably benefit from gas in the short term to meet their energy access and development needs for industrialization in particular. Uh, so you know, we don't, we don't advocate for fossil fuels at all. We are very much focused on building out, uh, promoting renewable energy. Um, but I think we also recognize that a blanket ban on the use of gas could lock African countries into reliance on diesel, heavy fuel, fuel oil, uh, traditional biomass for cooking, which is so, so harmful, uh, and even potentially coal. So it's just one of those things that uh, we, we, we want to raise that for consideration. But whatever a country does, that energy transition plan should show in the medium term how any gas capacity would phase out to meet net zero targets. So that's a critically important, important part of that. Uh, and another important part of that is having a clean energy offer. So the investment that's made in a country um, from development finance institutions, the multi multilateral development banks, um, so forth, that, that clean energy offer has to be sufficient uh, to help that country choose 
that clean energy pathway. Massively scaled up investment is essential. Um, um, I, I think everybody knows that. Finance underpins everything, and there are so many challenges here to get on track. But a first step is to rebuild trust and for developed countries to follow through on the promised $100 billion a year in climate finance for developing countries um, that was supposed to start uh, be reached by 2020, and it's still, still we're short of that. Um, to put this in perspective, I was um, in a meeting with the head of the IMF recently, and she, she said the 100 billion is basically a rounding error when you compare that to the estimated $14 trillion that the global community has mobilized in funding to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And this 100 billion is really just a fraction of what's needed. Um, to put it in context, uh, the energy transition plan that was developed for Nigeria. Now, Nigeria is the biggest economy in Africa, so uh, this is going to be very expensive. But it shows an additional $410 billion above business as usual spending is going to be required across the economy to bridge energy access gaps by 2030 and to achieve net zero by 2060. But that's one country. Another important mechanism to think about um, and that we're looking at for scaling up finance, um, especially in Africa, <clears throat> is the, and especially with the private sector, can be voluntary carbon markets. Um, but we really need support to scale the carbon markets, stimulate demand, uh, and really improve the reliability of, of carbon credits in Africa. Uh, but also look at what are the methodologies um, that really would um, be specific to the, the African context, <clears throat> such as offsetting the diesel gensets. Finally, women and youth must be at the forefront of helping address these challenges. Women play a critical role in social and economic development, so we cannot hope to meet our goals without their perspective and professional contribution to the energy transition. And at this critical moment, we need the talent, innovation, and enthusiasm of young leaders. At SE for All, we believe that women and youth should be recognized as change makers, leaders, disruptors, and trailblazers. <clears throat> we need their perspective, their innovation, their drive, and creativity to achieve a just and equitable energy transition. It's a good thing I'm, I'm closing <clears throat> as I lose my voice. Um, but I think we're all agreed that we must get to net zero by mid-century. We must work to ensure people around the world have the same economic and social opportunities as all of us who have abundant energy. There must be an understanding that economies at different stages of development will require different solutions and approaches to grow their economies and develop along a low carbon pathway. Bringing it back to three words I said at the beginning, climate, energy, and development. They are interlinked and must go hand in hand to underpin a just and equitable energy transition for people and for planet. Thank you very much. Some more. Thank you so much, Tracy. My goodness, um, your address and particularly that that slide that you showed just of around the world really just reminds us of the privilege that we have in terms of uh, access to energy compared to um, other parts of the world. Well, we're going to um, bring it back home a little bit and shift the geographical uh, focus to look at what's happening here in Ireland. And I'm delighted that we have Dr. Jean Moore, uh, who's going to be with us. She's a policy analyst at the National Economic and Social Council, um, who's been working on climate and sustainable development, most recently on climate and biodiversity on a shared island basis, on a just transition, sustainable recovery from COVID-19 and climate policy. Uh, Dr. Moore holds a PhD in environmental psychology from the University of Liverpool, and she has a huge interest in environment policy and social inclusion. Her, like everyone here, their CVs are amazing. She's a member of lots of different groups, including the Climate and Energy Working Group. But I'm going to, uh, at the IA, I'm going to stop now so we can listen to her. So you're very, very welcome, Jean. There we go. Thanks so much for the really nice introduction. That's fantastic. 
Um, so yes, I don't have to say who I am now. Um, I'm part of the, the Secretariat at the National Economic and Social Council, so we're very delighted to be part of this important conference. So let us see if this works, yes. So what I'm going to talk to you today is the work that we've been doing that touches on just transition. It's part of a broader focus on, on climate, biodiversity, sustainable development within the National Economic and Social Council. I'm going to just briefly take you, I suppose, on a very short tour of the concept of just transition from, from theoretical approach more to it being applied in practice and to try and really focus on the governance needed for just transition. And I think it's really important to recognize that along the way we, rec you know, we really understand that the, the low carbon transition is one of a number of transitions happening at the same time. So, Already we've heard this morning the importance of governance and the kind of critical issues of planning and development that we need to think about. So it's really important that we kind of have that focus. So I'm going to just go through those different um, elements and then I'm going to just conclude with the, our most recent project which is going to focus on agriculture and climate. We've heard a little bit about that this morning. So established in 1973, the National Economic and Social Council is established to provide a strategic advice to government and it particularly looks at economic, social and environmental advice. We have a, a fantastic council that is made up of representatives of unions, business, um, community and voluntary groups, farmers, NGOs, environmental perspective, government departments and independents. And the most recent reports that, that have really impacted on this work that I was involved in um, uh, as already been mentioned, was um, that collaboration on climate and biodiversity on a shared island, which really took a strategic overview across the island of some of these important issues and looked at the existing collaborations and potential for more. The Council also produced a report on addressing employment vulnerability as part of a just transition approach in 2020. And that report is largely influencing the work we, we're, we're talking about today. And as part of that, we had a number of research projects and papers, uh, one of which was by Sinead Mercier, who wrote a really interesting paper on four case studies on just transition, which I really recommend that you take a look at. So we've heard a little bit today about, about the imperatives of climate action. And I think what's really important is that we think and recognize them as societal challenges. We understand the, the economic, uh, we understand a little bit more about the technological, but the societal piece I think we're only just at the beginning of, particularly when we see the urgency of trying to stay uh, beneath 1.5 degrees, that the unequal impacts from climate policy and from climate change are going to increase the complexity of delivering policy in this area, and that we need to deliver this in a relatively short period of time, representing a considerable political challenge. And it requires policies that both um, appreciate that urgency, that are effective, but also where the burden is shared as, and brings the opportunities to as many people as possible. So it requires, in a sense, a societal support framework. It requires a sense of justice, equity, fairness, and inclusion. And as I mentioned, we're, we're dealing with more than one transition. So how do they intersect the digital transition, the circular economy uh, that we're moving towards, um, as well as trying to bring a restorative approach to bring as, uh, you know, biodiversity back uh, to health? How do we do that in a way that's integrated? And I think, again, the governance systems, the policy, um, policy process have been siloed. How do we begin to think about that in an integrated way? And the OECD and the EU have, have put you know, quite a lot of guidelines together around some of the, the, the regional you know, transitions that are needed, some of the guidelines around collaborative governance that might be needed, because the key part of this is thinking about the participatory and inclusive process of transition. That it isn't just about coming up with the most excellent policies and delivering them in, in a, you know, with the right resources in a certain time frame, but you have to bring people along. You also have to engage with their experiences on the ground. So this emphasis on collaborative governance, for example, a recent paper by the Community Platform in Ireland has really set together some of the really interesting examples of collaborative governance. But also social dialogue, which I'll talk in a moment, is the heart of a just transition 
uh, and, and NESC is, is no stranger to social dialogue. And, and I think bringing this perspective in, where you have multi-stakeholders -stake approach and multi-level governance is part of the broader framework of dealing with transitions. And that's recognized in the European Green Deal, that the transition must be fair, inclusive, putting people first and paying particular attention to supporting those regions, industries, workers, households and consumers that will face the greatest challenges. So, what is a just transition? Well, NEST defines it as one that seeks to ensure transitions are equitable, participative in a process and outcomes at national, regional and local level. But as we know, the, the concept of just transition came out of a trade union approach that really understood um, the importance of looking at employment uh, and jobs and development from a just transition perspective. And the ILO guidelines are really significant in this respect. It's also included in the preamble of the Paris Agreement as an, as an overarching framework. And NESC work has really looked at uh, explicitly looking at these principles, trying to align just transition policies with decarbonation measures and thinking about how do, how do we do that work. Um, and I think that approach is really the important to think about not just we've heard about climate justice, we've heard about social justice, um, and just transition touches on many of those different concepts. But the important way that we can think about them is in three ways. Procedurally, so we talk about this idea of listening to people. We have a process of inclusion. We have a transparent process, it's very important. We also talk about distribution. Who's going to be most impact? Where are the impacts going to be felt? And then restorative is another aspect of justice which talks about the historical uh, context in which justice is considered. So each of these need to be considered. And that we can learn from just transition your, you know, initiatives that have been undertaken already, particularly in relation to coal. The Coal Exit Commission, for example, in Germany provides a really interesting example of a regional structural change um, in La Trobe Valley in Australia, again, um, where you know, um, power generation had to switch quickly away from coal, how those communities have been supported to regenerate. And then you've got examples of, of commissions like the Scottish Just Transition Commission, which is in its second iteration, which has provided very interesting national advice um, I'll talk to you a little bit in a moment about that. So one of the key things that Sinead Mercer is look at the case studies across uh, Europe. One of the conclusions were that transitions are messy and complex and they take time. Secondly, that there isn't really a template out there to tell us how to do it. There's no off the shelf uh, approach. So we have to develop, as I've heard already, bespoke approaches. So NESC's work really try to understand how this might be delivered in relation to the digital and low carbon transitions. And it was asked by government to identify steps that could be taken to address the vulnerability of workers and firms and sectors in relation to both of these transitions. And I suppose it concluded that you needed a number of different things. You needed a focus on continuous um, preemptive work, workforce development. You needed to build resilient enterprises and, delivery, and deliver high impact targeted funding to support the transition. But mostly, I suppose, it talked about this just transition approach, that it needed to be purposeful, participate, and multifaceted, and that you needed a appropriate social protection, but you also needed sectoral measures and inclusive place-based approach. And it was that, that mix, I suppose, that drew the attention of, of President Michael D. Higgins, who really, um, I suppose, liked our work and talked about the, the need uh, of, of transition um, really focusing on all of government, setting out priority actions, the sequence of interventions and timeframes for implementation, and considering what resources were needed. So he understood that, that you really need to progress this in terms of the implementation phase. So moving from principles into practice, I think it's important to recognize NESC's sort of key recommendations and ideas we presented on Oireachtas Committee. Um, on climate action that really showed that what we need is purposive and proactive planning at national, regional, local levels in involving a wide range of actors. That you need this kind of participative social dialogue as part of public governance. You need a focus on, on quality, decent jobs, training and social protection. You need this place-based, regenerative, local bottom-up approach. And you also need fair, inclusive and equitable outcomes. And it's that interaction interaction that really is key to the NEST approach. 
So it's important, I think, to stand back and think, you know, okay, we're not alone in this. Other countries are struggling with, with developing in practice a just transition approach. Not all countries have tried to align it with climate policy. So while we are still at the beginning of this journey, we have already learned a great deal. I think the, the, the consideration of dealing with uncertainty and the sense of, well, I wouldn't start from here. Well, we just have to learn by doing, get on with it, I suppose, and think about some of the ways that we can progress. Other countries, as I mentioned, are doing the same. We have Scotland, um, really interesting examples, if you want to follow them, of just transition commissions who are, and now they, their advice have been taken on by national governance structure, where they're coming up with national transition plans. New Zealand has also developed an internal just transition unit advising regions who want to transition how best to do it. Northern Ireland has a commitment to establish a just transition commission. The Canadian task force has really developed a coal intensive regions there that really provides another really interesting example. And then in Wales, we know they've a focus on future generations, but they've also got plans to develop just transition so that we can really understand um, how other countries are developing this combination of an evidence-based research and scrutiny we heard before, monitoring, reporting, strategic advice and planning, but also building agility and flexibility in structures and in institutions. And I think it's that interaction of the governance, the kind of centre, but going out to context, local context and bottom-up participation is really critical to a just transition. So just to set the frame then briefly, the EU, as I mentioned, the Paris Agreement, international, we have that, we have that framework. We also have a commitment to Ireland signed up to the Silesia Declaration, which underpins a just transition approach um, and, and reaffirms the imperative of that. Then you have the context of the EU Just Transition Fund, uh, which is specifically designed to address the adverse effects of climate transition in carbon intensive regions across the EU by supporting those regions to work towards balanced socio-economic transition to a low carbon economy. Ireland is set to receive 84.5 million from this fund to the period of 2027, so it's a considerable investment. And we have submitted a draft to territorial just transition plan um, that sets out probably the area of the Midlands that will receive the bulk of this resource. And then most recently, the European Council has produce guidance to help member states devise and implement packages that ensure a fair transition. And they encourage member states to put in place comprehensive policy packages to strengthen the cross-cutting elements that promote fair green transition and make optimal use of public and private funding. And then in terms of Ireland's experience, um, our, the Midlands became the first focus of a just, trans just transition lens here when the decision was taken to suspend the operation of the peat industry um, and to stop using peat for industrial heat in a short space of time put tremendous pressure on communities and Borden and Mona, the semi-state uh, body in charge of, of this transition. The Just Transition Commissioner, Kira Mulvey, was, was um, really engaging with many of the communities impacted and has produced four reports that provided advice that government is now addressing in the Midlands implementation plan. Um, and I think the work of Borden Amon is interesting. They're, they're now developing wind energy and other projects. There's also been a bog restoration project that um, will be really important. Um, there's over 20 um, million euro have been invested in, in projects from the Just Transition Fund. And in relation to the bogs, I think it's a really interesting intersection between biodiversity and climate, that integrated solution um, that I think we need to see more of. But I think it's fair to say that there's learning from the Midlands. Um, recent research has pointed to the idea that a just transition process needs to be in place going forward. So how can we learn from our own experience and develop that further? So in terms of policy, we have the Climate Action Plan, which um, sets out Ireland's commitment to a just transition approach. And it seeks to align climate policy very directly with just transition. And it sets out an understanding of the tr that the transition needs to be fair, just, and the costs are shared equitably. And some of the processes that we've talked about already include the National Dialogue and Climate Action, which is a very important part of engaging uh, with a wide range of actors in the public around, around issues to do with just transition, but also climate literacy and many other areas. Um, we also have the important work of the, of the Joint Eructus Committee on Climate and Environment, because they've looked at just transition as part of their advice. 
We have the commitment to develop a statutory just transition commission in Ireland and work is ongoing to develop that, which will be um, very positive um, when, when that's uh, developed. And I think what's interesting about that is it, it will monitor progress, it will make recommendations to government, commission research, provide advice, support to government on social di on dialogue. But beyond that, we also have signs that just transition is spreading into other areas of policy. In our ru rural future, rural policy development, there is a real commitment to just transition and, and the expression that any burdens must be fair, no member of, of our society gets left behind. And then most interestingly, the Commission on Taxation and Welfare uh, talks about it, the importance of a just transition and, and says without it, the transformation required to protect both the planet and the people inhabiting it cannot be successful or sustainable. So lastly, I just want to mention the, the NESC work is now moving on to a sectoral approach, which is, I think, a novel approach to try and understand Ireland's particular just transition. Over a third of emissions are produced by the agriculture sector. And so under the Climate Action Plan, NESC was asked to explore how the climate targets and the transition that they apply for Irish, imply for Irish agriculture can be achieved in a manner that considers social equity and inclusion environmental resilience and socio-economic well-being. So we, we have a working group chaired by Professor Thea Hennessy of the UCC, and this working group is made up of councils, members, representatives from all the different pillars, but also experts in the area. And it's really interesting, we're halfway through that process, and we're really going to try and make the process as inclusive as possible. And this week, we're running workshops with farmers across three regions in Ireland. And we're trying to bring in a sense of what would a governance for just transition process look like in that? And some of the key questions that we're thinking about, you know, what kinds of structures and functions really are important. For example, I mentioned in relation to oversight, this sort of forward looking and planning, a flexible, proactive approach. And then we th think about what policies, what practices and processes might be needed. You know, what kind of scrutiny, monitoring roles, what kind of processes of dialogue would you need? And then and lastly, what kind of specific uh, outcomes are we really talking about in relation to investment, but also in terms of the particular sector that we're, we're thinking about? So just to conclude, um, I think it's important to recognize that we are moving in a developmental phase from just transition in theory to in practice, and we're not you know, alone in this journey. And I think what's going to re be required is a bespoke, collaborative and inclusive approach um, with appropriate governance and resources. And that we have tremendous potential to learn from, from the Midlands and from European and other international uh, contexts and really try to provide this leadership role. Ireland could really genuinely be a leader in just transition and how it approaches it. And the Council's latest work, which takes a novel approach to look at a sector, is really going to add to that perspective. So thanks very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Jean. And just to say that uh, if you can, please keep all of your questions coming in uh, through Slido if you want, because we will get a chance to chat on the panel. And if nothing else, it makes my job that little bit easier when you're doing my work for me. But let's move on to our final uh, speaker of this session. It's going to be fantastic because uh, Dr. Brenda Boardman is going to speak to the critical question of fuel poverty. Uh, Dr. Boardman is widely considered as one of the most distinguished experts globally in the area of fuel poverty and we're delighted that you're with us today. She's an Emeritus Fellow at the Environmental Change Institute at the University of Oxford uh, following her retirement in September 2008 and she's also a visiting professor at the University of Exeter. Um, her research is fascinating uh, particularly on the way energy is used in British homes particularly by low income households and I know that her address will have huge resonance here in Ireland as well. So you're very, very welcome, Dr. Boardman. No table. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be here in Dublin. Delighted. Uh, uh, I took the risk of flying. I wasn't going to, but Barry Cove wrote me such a nice letter I had to. Uh, I make some apologies that all of the comments I'm going to be ma making are based on experience in the UK. I only make some apology because what I hope 
is that you will be able to pick up on what I am saying, to extend it, to develop your ideas in Ireland if you're not there already, and very importantly, take those ideas to Brussels, to the European Commission, which is something that someone from Britain can't do anymore, so, sadly. Right, I come to this from a consumer perspective. As, as uh, Derville said, I've worked on fuel poverty now for nearly 40 years. And I l I'm absolutely horrified at the situation that is developing at the moment with the energy price crisis. <clears throat> One of the things that sits, that's happened since the uh, Ukraine war and the growth in prices is that people like me who've only talked and researched on the demand side have now got to talk to people who work on the supply side. Uh, you heard from Dieter Helm earlier. Um, and this is quite a challenging process. So I ask you to be a little bit tolerant of me because I've brought together these two sides and we normally do not talk. Uh, interestingly, Dieter didn't use the words fuel poverty. Uh, the people that I work with, mainly Michael Grubb at the University, of College, at University College London, very rarely talk about fuel poverty. Gradually, we're beginning to make the supply side and the demand side talk to each other. This isn't trivial. Right, I'm going to give you some things that I hope we all agree on, and I'm not going to really talk about. Uh, yes, the energy bill crisis is disastrous. I don't know how many of us know or have any views on how long it's going to last, but I think it's going to be years, not months. Uh, it is absolutely disastrous for many consumers. How many depends on how high the price goes, particularly in comparison with what it has been. But there is no doubt about it, this is a very urgent problem. I think it's absolutely unbelievable how bad it has got. Uh, the, yes, there's a moral and political imperative to help them. And our government, and I'm sure your government, is, is financially supporting households to an extent, and also businesses. Um, and that's very expensive. We're talking, we get into the billions so quickly now, don't we? Um, at the same time, we've got suppliers, I'm not sure about ESB in this case, but the suppliers making absolutely huge, I would call obscene, profits. Um, and I, I have to say, as, as this whole situation developed, I just couldn't under, understand how this money had to be taken from the poor households and given to rich companies. So I, I started getting rather upset and angry. Uh, the thing you may not know about and agree with me yet is about the targeted compensation for households. It is actually very difficult to identify the households at an address-specific level, at least one person's nodding, <laughs> at an address-specific level in order to compensate them. Do you do all pensioners? Do you do all disabled? Do you do all people that are on a means-tested benefit? Or in Ireland, do you do everybody on a fuel allowance? And as the bills go up, those that are really hurting increases. So, for instance, when we just had pre the, the crisis, you just looked at those that were in fuel poverty, and that's the same as energy poverty. You could say those were the people on a means-tested benefit. But even then, back in about 2020, in the UK, it looked fantastic. 75% of the people that were in fuel poverty were on a means-tested benefit. Right, that's a good number, we can go and target them. But if you did that, only 27% of the money going to the people on means-tested benefit actually resulted in help. The other 73% were not in fuel poverty. And this is, this is a real problem. So I happen to know that targeting was difficult. And of course, many people on the supply side who didn't know about fuel poverty hadn't recognized it. And of course, there's a climate emergency. 
Now, much of what I'm talking about is the present thinking as I've understood it in the UK. I don't represent a company. I don't represent a large body of people. I just represent some academic thinking. I th the one consensus that I believe is happening is that the present electricity market is now no longer fit for purpose. What we've got is fossil fuel generation, a system based on fossil fuel generation, which is designed around generation that has running costs, high running costs at the moment. We have also got increasingly renewable generation with no running costs, effectively no running costs. They don't buy fossil fuel. They've got the sun and the wind but they do have large upfront capital cost programs. It's a very different type of generation, and at the moment we've got them working together. And with renewables, it's perfectly possible to have long-term fixed contracts, that's what they want, in order to get the money to invest. Uh, the present system in, in Great Britain um, <clears throat> is based on a half-hourly basis a day ahead. The various suppliers say, I will provide this amount of capacity for this particular half hour, and I will do so at the following price. And as you get the different suppliers added in up to the total you want, the price increases, because you start, the national grid and the regulator start by taking the cheapest electricity, but you go up the scale. Now, what is to my mind, a slightly bizarre situation is that the, the last person, the last company to provide supply for that particular half hour is inevitably the most expensive, largely because they're the least efficient, and they set the price for all the rest. The cheap renewables, the cheaper gas, the more efficient gas, all of them would have been happy to sell at a lower price, but they are getting this maximum price. I have to say, I don't know how we managed to come up with a system which, to my non-supply side mind, looks like feather bedding, if nothing else. Uh, it, and it's what's called the marginal cost approach. So that was what was worrying me when I looked at the problems facing the fuel pool. And thanks to talking to the lovely Michael Grubb, uh, these are the thoughts that are around at the moment. And I think many people in, in the UK are sharing this. I don't know what the situation is in Ireland. We've got to change the energy market, especially the electricity market. We've got to split it into two so that there is the present original system with the dirty supply coming from fossil fuels which is expensive with high running costs, that is one market. It's the present market, but we hive it off in some way. How, how much the division is uh, complete and how you do this is a different set of questions. Quite separately, the green supply from renewables, which is not expensive, it is cheap and it is getting cheaper, is a separate market. And uh, as Paddy described, the renewables market is already supplying something under, just under half of the electricity in Ireland and about 40% or more in the um, GB. You put that green supply into something called, at the moment, the green power pool. This is, you have to understand this is a debate. This is not happening. It is a possible solution. If you can come up with something better, good. But at the moment, this is the best that I know about, and that's what I'm telling you. Um, we have in the UK um, a thing called Contracts for Difference. It's a very nice auction that happens periodically. The government puts a certain number of millions of pounds on the table and says to the suppliers, we want some new capacity, bid for it. And the cheapest gets the contracts. It's a long-term contract, as I said, and they get it. Almost exclusively, that is offshore wind. 
and the price is going down, 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 down. We've got down to f five pence per kilowatt hour coming from renewables at the supply side. And when, at, at the moment, um, I don't know about you, but I'm paying 34 pence for my electricity at the meter, or pretty close to 34 cents. We've got pretty close to parity. Those auctions do provide long-term contracts. Uh, and as I said, it's almost exclusively offshore wind. Um, that situation, those auctions have already taken place. We have already got a large amount of renewable electricity coming cheaply into the UK system. I'm not sure that you've got the same situation here in Ireland. I don't think it would be too difficult to do. It certainly escalates the amount of renewables being generated. Uh, <clears throat> I therefore think it could be quite quick and easy to start developing a green power pool using the existing situation as well. I've put down there incorporating the original green suppliers. They are operating under a slightly different renewable obligation system with us. And I, as I said, I'm not sure about what happens with you. So have, we've now got a source through the green power pool of really cheap, clean electricity. How do we help the fuel poor? We put all the fuel poor, however defined, are to receive that cheap electricity from the green power pool. It's not people like me that think of themselves as environmentalists. It is the poorest people that need to have the cheapest electricity. This would start relieving the government of their support systems, which are hugely expensive. It would go directly from the green power pool to those consumers or somebody representing them. It would not go via the wholesale market. It would not get contaminated by the prices of fossil fuels. It would stay separate. There are other groups that will, you might want to give it to, and that depends a little bit on how much re uh, renewable electricity you've got. It might be SMEs, the small and medium-sized enterprise. It might be energy-intensive industries. But we've now got a body of really deserving and important people or companies who have got cheap electricity prices that is independent of the price of gas and fossil fuels. Stage one. What do we do about the fuel poor who are not yet using electricity for heating? They're using gas or oil. We've got to transfer them out of those fossil fuels into this new cheap green electricity power pool market. Uh, so you, we've talked about, I've heard you talk about heat pumps and about electric heating generally. But this is independently of transport and electric cars. You can only put a household on a heat pump if it is well insulated because the cost of electricity is too high in comparison with gas, certainly in the UK. And what, what do I mean by properly insulated? I hope I've got the right reference to your, your building energy ratings. Um, uh, you've got to have a large energy efficiency program. So the homes of the poorest households are on A1 or B2. They're certainly better than C1 if you can possibly get there. That is a non-trivial task if I've understood the housing stock in Ireland in comparison with ours. So you've got, first of all, get them onto cheap electricity, then get them all electric, then you have an end of fuel poverty. And these are not major structural alterations to the market, but they are substantial differences and investments. So there's some parallel policies. Uh, first of all, and uh, Paddy was already talking about this, you want a lot of new renewables, probably very large developments, maybe it's all wind from uh, uh, offshore wind, um, but you've got to do that as quickly as possible, and it sounds like ESB have got some good plans to do that. 
If all that electricity goes straight into the green power pool, the green power pool is getting bigger and bigger. That means you can do more households. And there's a very, very difficult debate about how many households you want to get this quantity of green electricity. It depends on how much there is available, but it also depends on how you think hardship is affecting people. We, we, fuel poverty in Britain used to be about 13, 1, 3%. We're now talking of 20, 30, 40% of households having difficulties with their fuel bills, even after um, our government has put in 150 billion pounds. This is the, some really nasty issues coming together. It's a really difficult set of wicked problems. So just as you've got the green power pool growing, and you've then got to find a way of transferring the fuel poor onto that green tariff. I don't know how easy it will be, but I hope some fuel poor households could go onto a green tariff as soon as possible. They are already, as at the moment, suffering the problems of heating or eating, being cold in winter, we know that this is a real problem. We know that many more people are suffering. We've got to somehow start this green tariff, this green power pool, as soon as possible. Yes, you need a large energy efficiency program, uh, which means that you've uh, then got the ability to install the electric heating into air uh, through air source heat pumps into these same homes. <laughs> I've been saying for many years in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way, that the poorest people should live in the most energy-efficient homes. They are the people with the smallest incomes. So therefore, 10% of their income to spend on energy or whatever rubric you want to use is a very small amount of money. It's a lot smaller than my 10%. It's a lot smaller than many cases than your 10%. But we're beginning to get to a situation where the poorest people could be both in the most energy efficient homes with the cheapest sources of energy. That would be good for fuel poverty and good for climate change. Uh, I, I just want to give you a couple of references to the work by Michael uh, Grubb, as I said, he's a professor at the University College London. Um, some of this evolves from debates with him. Quite a bit of it is in my head rather than his. So I'm not committing him to thinking like this. I'm just saying this is the way in which some of the debate is happening. And it really is very difficult to bring these huge different changes from the energy supply side and from the household side together. But I hope I've given you an indication and that this is part of how we accelerate to net zero. Thank you. Thank you so much. Some people have been asking um, about, because you've been taking copious notes about these slides, and they will be made available of all of the speakers, uh, the slides will be available um, on the IEA website after the conference. Thank you very, very much for all of your questions, which uh, are remarkably similar to the ones I myself was thinking of asking our panel. But I want to maybe um, pick up with you, first of all, um, Tracy. The, well, you, you cited the scale of the global response to COVID, 14 trillion. Um, and we can see why people bought into that crisis very, very quickly, not least because of all of the deaths and the, the illness. Um, we're facing another really, really urgent global uh, crisis. Where is the money going to come from? Is it going to be because we have, in one sense, we've got used to big government. That's one of the consequences of COVID and indeed the last crisis, financial crisis. So where is the money going to come from to achieve the SDG 7 targets? Is it going to be public? private, both? Yes. <laughs> I, can, I can elaborate. I can elaborate. To, yeah, but to, but, but, it's, but it to is, what extent? You um, know? It can't be all government. Um, we, we know that it can't be all government. There, there's just not enough government money to be able to do this. And, and it shouldn't be all government. It, it really does have to come to the private sector. And it, and it has to be, um, we, we, we've got to do this in a way to catalyze markets in these countries to be able to, to um, scale up. Um, 
But what we can do is use government funds, um, your funding through development finance institutions, the multilateral development banks, um, you know, the, the bilateral um, agreements that countries have, um, to, to spur bringing in the private sector. And, and there's you know, various ways that you can do that. Um, somebody actually mentioned, de we actually have heard a few times, de we have to change the way we do de-risking. We also have to think, you know, change the way we think about this um, and think of this, these initial funds as an investment. So not a giveaway, but as an investment. Um, but there's other ways to, to get the private sector engaged. One way um, is results-based financing. So results-based financing uh, is, is something that um, um, you, you, you see on a small scale, growing scale, for energy, it's been used in, in other ways in the past. It's just started over the last few years to really be used for energy access. Uh, but you're paying for, um, it's a grant usually, and it comes verification of the energy connection. So the risk is on the private sector. They put up the funds at the beginning with the uh, agreement that if they get to these verified energy connections, uh, they'll get that grant at the back end. So we're doing that now uh, in three countries, in Madagascar, Sierra Leone, and Benin. Um, uh, we've just added Nigeria as well. Um, and you know, a, again, um, it just, it will sp give that impetus to the private sector to come in, um, making sure that it is a verified connection, making sure that it's also a verified connection, not at the moment of connection, but that it's actually staying operational. Um, in Nigeria, for example, what we're doing there, and it's, it, what we're doing there is funding solar for productive use. So we're taking a little bit different uh, approach. They get 30% of the capital cost of a system uh, when it's installed, when it's operational and verified. They get another 10% two years later. So if they can make sure that they keep that system operational, uh, they get an added bonus at the back end. Um, but right now, it's, it's not financially viable for the private sector to completely take on energy, act, you know, energy access. It's, it's, it's for the poorest people. So they're not able to pay a full market rate. So there has to be some subsidy at this point. Um, but that's one way of bringing the private sector in, is using results-based financing. Um, and and that, those funds that are coming to us to pay that grant are coming from governments and philanthropies. And Brenda, just on that point, you know, the notion having a green pool, the, the, those hardest hit by fuel poverty, you know, being on that green tariff. Again, how is that going to work out in terms of that public private sector balance, given the scale of investment that is needed for, for just even like the, the retrofitting of homes that you cited, just as one example? Um, I think government's got to lead on an awful lot of that to protect uh, these valuable commodity, the green power, from getting, as I would call it, contaminated by the fossil fuel market, which is, there will be some role for private enterprise. Uh, we have a, a, a lot of uh, private pa uh, power, PPAs, private power agreements between individual solar farms, for instance, and a supplier, but somehow or other, that electricity then gets priced at the rate, as I mentioned, of, of fossil fuels. And that's something, we've just got to break that link. There is absolutely no reason why green electricity should be paying the, for the, or charged at the rate of these fossil fuels. I think, I mean, I understand that ESB is, is largely government owned anyway, so we've got a good start here. <laughs> Uh, and I think that the government has to, um, I think, start by funding the energy efficiency improvements in people's homes. I would give the responsibility to each local authority and say, here's the money. You've got to make sure that the homes that are the most energy inefficient and occupied by low-income households, it's, 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 it's a difficult combination but you can find out about it. Concentrate on getting those homes up to a high level of energy efficiency. It would do the fuel poor no favors whatsoever to put them on a heat pump 
without the Doing energy the in efficiency yes, the first of all. Jean, can I just bring you in just on that notion of how you bring communities along? Like, I mean, the um, debate over heat, our peat harvesting in Ireland has been deeply emotional um, for many, uh, many communities. And I also think of the agricultural sector, which I know often complains that it is demonized. You know, so how do we start conversations that that really kind of bring people along on that journey because many will feel ostracized or alienated and therefore excluded uh, from the conversation. I think we're at a very challenging time um, for the, the, the scale of the transition, the, the rapidity of it. And I think those kind of conversations through the National Dialogue and Climate Action, through the work of community energy groups, for example, around the country, there are really positive examples. SEI, for example, have mm -hmm. really interesting network of energy communities around Ireland. Um, we did some work on community energy and, and wind energy and just looking at the kind of engagement needed. And what we learned from that was you need to set out this sort of transition direction. So you need to have this broad participative, um, I suppose, direction of travel. But then you need to find ways of connecting up the bottom-up experience. So how, for example, a group in Tipperary who want to maybe develop solar energy or maybe they want to have anaerob anaerobic digestion, how do they engage with developers or with funders or with the legal sort of supports that they might need? So that sort of connection between action that's already happening, the expertise that can be provided through an intermediary, uh, an energy mentor, for example, um, with the kind of connecting that up with the national policy direction. So there are models in which you can deliver that because what I do think is that there's, there is tremendous um, enthusiasm amongst Irish people to get involved and get, but they often don't know what to do yeah. to, to make that transition. You, you heard the minister earlier on saying that there's sort of a, a non-partisan approach, but when you live in a country as small as this, often when it gets to our parliament, um, the parish pump can be very, very strong. Does the political environment need to align on that bigger picture, particularly when it is perhaps their parish or their community or their constituency that may be affected the most? Brenda, you might have a, a view on that. Well, I love community energy groups. I'm part of one myself, even in North Oxford, we have one. But what you have to realize, Devlin, the few poor do not have any capital. They have no voice. They, well, apart from not having any voice either, they're too busy coping with poverty. Um, but they don't have any money. Um, in Britain, we've got something like 30% of households with no savings, no savings. So how do you go to them and say, put in loft insulation, or put in double glazing, or insulate your walls, or put in LEDs in all your light? You just can't do it. And community energy groups, wonderful though they are, and wonderful though their activities often can be, cannot come up with that level of capital. It has to come from government. Tracy, before I let everybody escape on to lunch, I just wanted to ask you just about something Dieter said earlier about you know, the need for system-wide planning. And he had a, um, a sort of a dim view of COP26. And I was just wondering ahead of um, the meeting in Egypt next month, um, given the urgency of the situation, again, are, are they sufficient? You know, or, you know, is COP26, COP27 sufficient for the challenge that we're facing, or is he, is he right that it's a much, much bigger um, systemic change that needs to happen? Uh, do, they, do they still have value? I, I think there's still, yes, there's still value. Um, is it as ambitious as it needs to be? Not by far. Uh, I, I think what we're already seeing, um, you know, countries should be coming to COP27, with higher ambition in their NDCs, what we're hearing is that they're not going to be, uh, not likely to be. COP26, I think the, the most positive things that came out of COP26 were outside of the government negotiations. Um, there were a lot of other announcements from the private sector, from philanthropies, um, on the energy access side, for example, the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet was announced, and this was, this is, a coalition of philanthropies that have come together, uh, pulled their funds, really trying to pull their efforts. And it's, it, it's a, yeah, a great effort to really try to address energy poverty um, because we're not seeing the, the systemic and the, um, the, the really global response from, from government. So philanthropies are really stepping in. 
Um, private sector is even stepping in. As I said, on results-based financing, that's an area. Carbon markets is another big area. So there's these, I, I think it's still important that you get governments around the table, you still negotiate, you still try to come up, that's the only way you're gonna come up with, with binding, mostly binding agreements is through that process, but it has to be supplemented. Um, through other means as well. And that's why I just finally, Jean, just looking at the, um, the final piece of your work when you're talking about specific outcomes, including enforcement, you know, because um, I'm just sort of interested in, because for the NSC, it must be kind of political work in and of, of itself. What do you think is the balance between sort of the diplomatic approach and the collaborative approach versus at some point someone has to shout stop? I think we've been looking at some really interesting work around, you know, sort of experimental governance and learning and how, how do you set things where you can have different, for example, you set a, a direction of travel and then you allow flexibility in how that's progressed, but ultimately you have a penalty default, you have something that happens if progress isn't made. And I think that balance between, yes, you need regulation at the end of the day, you know, for many areas that are difficult to do without it, but it's that sort of allowing flexibility, allowing learning by doing, and rewarding, I suppose, efforts. I think seeing that signal from government, that sort of mission-oriented approach, is really very helpful that European Union has taken on that sort of Mazzucato um, missions. And I think that sort of, you know, the, 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 the flying to the moon kind of sense that we're all trying to work towards the same direction, but allowing different approaches, rewarding you know, where that innovation happens, but then ultimately recognizing that regulation is always going to be there as a default. And I think that sort of ratcheting up of ambition needs to have that, that link between those different levels. Well, the only enforcement I will have is that you will all have to be back here by two o'clock. We're going to let you go for lunch now, but for now, to thank Brenda, Jean, and Tracy, thank you very, very much.